Oscar Bevis, IFL TV, proudly sponsored by The Last. Look who's joined me, Mr. Steve Kim, respected boxing scribe, I'll call you. How are you, mate? Oh, thank you. Well, wow, that's, that's, a, that's a fancy introduction there. That is my pleasure. Thank you for giving me some of your time. Um, just a reflection on what we've seen uh, in the ring, Devin Haney beating Jojo Diaz, 117-111 was one of the cards, which I don't think went down too well. 116-112, um, the other two, but... Yeah, Devin, uh, a clear winner tonight. thought he won. That was close but clear. I, I wouldn't call this a great fight. What I'd call it is a good, solid boxing match. Two well school technicians, the natural size of Haney, the range, a little bit more reflexive, a little bit quicker off the trigger and longer. I think we're the difference in that fight. Uh, Diaz was very clever in there, slipping and landing the counter left and also getting to the body. He was really disciplined in keeping that backhand up, blocking a lot of the right hands of Haney. But I just I didn't think that Diaz did enough in enough rounds to make this closer. Personally, I, c I could have seen 116-112 or 115-113. No doubt who won the fight, though. The issue with Joseph Diaz is I don't think he's a real natural lightweight, and he doesn't hit hard enough to make up for a lack of activity, if that's going to happen. So Now, the question I have with Haney is, and I was talking to some of the people like Pauli Molinaggi out there and other boxing people, how does he fare at 140 against bigger punchers? I think there's some question marks there. Well, we obviously he's at 135 at the moment and we expect him to fight for, for the undisputed crown. Just quickly, one more thing um, on Jojo. Do you think he'll walk away with maybe a couple of regrets? Because when he stuck it on him in the 12th, it was one of them where people looking at each other going, why wasn't this done in the 9th or the 10th? He, he had to make this a war of attrition and I thought at times he was too inactive. And you're right, in the 12th round, he had two minutes to do something. Something, you got 120 seconds here to change your life, pull the upset, and quite frankly, it didn't happen. And I thought in a, in a lot of other rounds that were really close, those last 30 seconds, you can leave an imprint on a judge and, in essence, steal a round or make it 51-49 in your direction. And there were times I thought he was expending energy. And the problem is when you're not the puncher or if you're not a puncher at all, those rounds, you could lose a lot of rounds closely and you could lose every single round. And that, that's kind of what happened with Joseph. He's been cursed in a sense that he's a clever boxer, but he's not so slick that he never gets hit. He's a sharp puncher, but he's not particularly heavy-handed, and that's why it, this looked a little bit like his fight with Gary Russell, to be honest with you. Do you think we learned anything we didn't know about Devin Haney tonight? Devin Haney's Devin Haney. He's sound, he's solid, technically very grounded. My biggest re uh, question about him is how long can he hold 135? He's a big, strong, young man. He's only 23, but he started his career six years ago at 135. He's at that stage now. He's probably bursting out at the seams. I know the weight cut. Uh, I know some people that are in charge of that. They'll tell you it's strenuous. Uh, but in the era of the weigh-ins now taking 28 to 30 hours before the opening bell, a lot of guys try to cheat the weight and be a weight bully. But uh, the other question is, you can look at it both ways. At 140, he's going to face bigger, stronger guys. But at 140, he might actually be stronger in the legs and the backside. So that's the question. One thing I noticed about Devin, he's athletic. He's a very good boxer, but he's not as slick as you think. He gets touched a lot down the middle. When I think of a slick fighter that's really defensively sound, I think of guys like Shakur Stevenson, who's airtight. You cannot hit that guy with your knuckles. You can't. So that's the question that I have. I get the sense that as he moves up in weight and faces more dangerous young guys that could punch a little bit, Devin's going to have to bite down a little bit because I, I don't think his punching power is going to increase at 140. Just in terms of, you talk about his defense, and I see the zone comparisons in the week comparing him to Floyd, and it's so dangerous comparing a young fighter there's to Floyd. No Floyd. Yeah, I, we, we I was just saying, yeah. There's no Floyd. Just like there's only one Mona Lisa. Uh, it's a dangerous comparison it's anyway. Like, there's only one Eiffel Tower. I, why, why do we have there's to go? Not. I'm in Vegas. I've yeah. seen the one in Paris. I've okay, seen the one in Vegas. Knockoff. <laughs> that, that is a faux Eiffel Tower. I'm just, why can't we let guys be who they are? Look, Devin is very good. One thing I like about him, and, and having known him, we both work with Snack. We both have a close association with Victor Conte, is that he's a very mature young man. He's very intelligent, very grounded. Out of, out of the four guys that we talk about with him, Ryan Garcia, uh, Tank Davis and Teo, I think he has the most maturity. He's very grounded, very reliable. But boy, when you start comparing guys to Mayweather, you know, we have, we have to look at how good Mayweather was. I was there a long time ago when he fought Gennaro Hernandez when he won his title. At, I think it was age 20, 21, uh, when he absolutely blitzed Diego Corrales, two of the best performances I've ever seen. You know, people have to understand, he put in 37 fights in 11 years before he got to De La Hoya. It's a long road for these young men. So when we start trying to make comparisons or crowning these young men. We have to understand their road is really just beginning. And in terms of Devin um, facing George Cambosis now, uh, well, 
they've spoken about it so much, it kind of has to happen. We know nev nothing is ever that smooth, but it kind of has to happen. All the belts together. Um, how does that play out? Based on what I saw tonight, I think the Emperor has clothes. I, I know he's going to be the underdog. His engine, his mentality, he's an above average puncher. He's got more hand speed than I anticipated. And he's rising with confidence. And look, one guy might be the bigger physical force in there, but it's not a bodybuilding contest. One guy makes that weight a little bit more effectively. And Cambosis is a dog. He is a Doberman in there. At the moments that Joseph Diaz let off the gas pedal, I think Cambosis will stick right on him. Uh, I actually think that's a real fight, real pitch battle. Just on Cambosis, obviously, uh, we saw him last week, and I don't want to call it a sh say we were shocked by what we saw because I saw him well, when he we fought Lee shocked, Selby. We were, we were shocked. We were I saw shocked. him fight Lee Selby, and I wasn't... Okay, I was shocked. Okay, I was shocked. I was shocked. How good was he last weekend? He was unbelievable. And my question is, is he a one-hit wonder? Is he Buster Douglas? Is, is he a guy that happened to have a great night? But give, give guys credit. They get better. He's a hard-nosed young man. Rose to the occasion. But you're right. When you, as you saw him against Lee Selby, I was at ringside when he fought Mickey Bay. That fight was even going into the last stages. We have to be honest about this. There's a reason why he was a huge underdog there weren't a lot of people outside of the Cambosis family that was tabbing him to win we don't we don't have to go out there and second guess or you know go out and say boy that was a freezing bad take there we all had the same take I'm a big fan of Teofimo but in certain respects you could see this happening that Teofimo's weight cuts very tough wasn't very focused I think there was certainly a lot of turmoil in his life but you got to fight the fight and Cambosis at his core is a consummate fighter just finally, I've got one more thing actually. Tio at 140, how does he fare? Better. But I'm not worried about him physically. Physically, I think he's okay. I worry about him psychologically. I really do. And I'm not trying to be flippant about it, but as I read his social posts, social media statements, and some of the things that he's been through in the background, he has to work out a situation. Is he going to, I don't want to say cave to the pressure, but will there be a change in the corner? I'm not so sure that's an easy move for him to make. That is still his father. And, boy, just looking at some of the things that he has tweeted and put on Instagram recently, I'm not going to lie to you, they're a little troubling. And I'm not saying that we should put him on suicide watch. What I'm saying is I just wonder how stable it is. And we've seen this before where one loss can be so debilitating from a psychological standpoint. Guys are never the same. This is like Humpty Dumpty. He fell off the wall and there's a million pieces and you're thinking, ah, oh, geez, all, can all the king's men put him back together again. So that's, so this is going to be fascinating. As high as I was on the Teofimo Express, as I dubbed him four years ago, I don't want to be a guy that flip-flops, but I flip-flopped. Now I have just as many worries about his future. In terms of his character, is he the sort of character where, and I spoke to Ben Davison, and I, I never really thought of it this way until Ben suggested it, sometimes one singular win can rocket you to money, style of fame very quickly. Not like he's a you know, them rock musicians mind. that go off the plot and whatever. Just... Just too much at once, maybe? No doubt. I remember telling the dad, the father, at this point last year, and I've written it, I've said it, now I'm going on right. So I thought they should have gone as right back to the ring. They mistook the Lomachenko victory for landing on the moon instead of an opportunity to launch their career and really get to work. 16 fights in at age 23, there's never been a pay-per-view star. There's never been what I would call a true mega star. You have to put work in, like Canelo. Look how many years and fights it took Canelo, Floyd Mayweather. And I think they, they lost their perspective on exactly what that victory was. That victory gave them an opportunity, but it didn't mean they had arrived at the destination. And when, once they started, you know... It wasn't the pinnacle. It wasn't the pinnacle. They, they, they had not reached the, the peak of Mount Everest yet. They were still beginning that climb. And when you go to war with your promoter, you start going to the purse bid, and then the thing gets thrown in 18 different directions. You're like, wait a minute. At a certain point, you're a boxer. And my view is this. If you're a boxer under the age of 25 and you have less than 20 fights, you need to fight more than twice a year. You need to fight more than once every eight, nine months because your skill set at that particular stage is like a blade. And there's two things here. You're either sharpening that blade or it gets dull. I thought we saw a dull blade last week.